Uh, Lieutenant Colonel retired U.S. Air Force John Grenier is a prize-winning author and historian of early America. Dr. Grenier is the author of The First Way of War, American War Making on the Frontier, and uh, the subject of tonight's uh, discussion. It won the, the Society of Military History's Outstanding Book Award in American History in 2007. He's also the author, author of The Far Reaches of Empire, The War in Nova Scotia, 1710 to 1760. It also won the Wilson Award as the outstanding contribution to national defense in the field of arts and letters. His current project is a biography of Major Robert Rogers. Those of you who have earned Ranger tabs should uh, hearken unto that name, which he hopes to finish in 2012. And Dr. Grenier took his Ph.D. from the University of Colorado in 1999, and he currently teaches in the online Master of Arts in Military History program at Norwich University, some participants of which we have with us uh, tonight. He retired just this year from the uh, Air Force after a 20-year uh, career, which included two tours at the U.S. Air Force Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. John Grenier. Mike, thank you for that kind introduction. I'd like to begin tonight by expressing my gratitude for the invitation to speak as part of this lecture series. Uh, it's been a long road getting here, as Mike has just, uh, just told you. Uh, we've been trying to schedule this lecture since 2007, but my military duties kept uh, getting in the way. Not that I was doing anything particularly important or heroic in the military, but um, I suddenly became the indispensable man just right when I wanted to retire, as Mike mentioned. So. Um, I greatly appreciate AHEC's patience in getting me here, and I, I uh, greatly appreciate all you being here tonight. Um, I'm generally honored to have you include me as a speaker among the luminaries that normally speak in this venue. I hope I don't disappoint you, and that you can take away as much from my talk this evening as I'm sure you did from previous talks in this series. Tonight, I'd like to speak to you about and discuss the argument that I made in my 2005 book, The First Wave War, American War Making on the Frontier, 1607 to 1814. I've been pleasantly surprised with the reception that the First Wave War has received within academia as well as the general public. I realize that is very much a work of revisionist history and as such has become a lightning rod for many. Indeed, some on the far right have accused me of being politically correct in writing a book that does little more than disparage America's military heritage while some on the far left have leveled the accusations that I use the book to glorify war and Anglo-Americans' conquest and domination of native peoples. I take solace in that those reviews generally say more about the reviewer than my book. Moreover, there is something I must admit satisfying in knowing that I have ruffled the feathers of a few on both sides of the political divide. That said, my goal this evening is to explain to you the basic point I try to make in the first wave of war. I do not think it's possible to understand the argument I make in the book or its significance without being aware of the historiographic context in which I wrote the first wave war. Therefore, I will use the first part of my talk to explain to you my interpretation of the Wigley thesis that so powerfully shaped my thinking as I developed the first wave war argument. Along the way, I point out several sidebars that help put the colonial period's military history in context with other facets of American history and military theory. And as a quick sidebar here, this is primarily for those of you in the Air War College audience, so you can uh, go back and maybe engage with your professors on these, these aspects. Last, I address my book's thesis directly and explain to you how the first wave of war developed and evolved over the first two centuries of American military experience. I began my study of an American way of war as an attempt to understand one of, early America's mil one of early American military history's most perplexing ambiguities and contradictions. The place and relationship of what we know today as unlimited war and what 18th century writers termed petty guerre, or little war, in the American military tradition. Unlimited war in both its modern and earliest American manifestations centers on destroying the enemy's will or ability to resist by any means necessary especially by focusing attacks on civilian populations and the infrastructure that supports them. French military theorists began to speak of petty guerre in the middle of the 18th century. During the Duke of Wellington's Peninsular Campaign in the Napoleonic Wars, Anglophones replaced petty guerre with the Spanish diminutive guerrilla to, to describe the practice of what Anglophones knew as quote-unquote irregular warfare. Military theorists now use several different terms in place of petty guerre, including irregular, guerrilla, partisan, unconventional, or special operations. 
Unconventional is a term that theorists developed in the 20th century to address aspects of modern warfare that fall outside quote unquote regular state on state or army on army forms of war making and is now taking on the specific meaning of training indigenous forces to serve as proxies. Today's United States military places those kinds of wars under the rubric of low intensity conflict. But no matter what we call it or how we define it today, early Americans understood war to involve disrupting enemy troop, supply and support networks, gathering intelligence through scouting and taking of prisoners, ambushing and destroying enemy detachments, serving as patrol and flanking parties for friendly forces, operating as advanced and rear guards for regular forces, and most important, and again, I can't stress this enough, most important, destroying enemy villages and fields and killing and intimidating enemy non-combatant populations. I am the first to admit that I stood on the shoulders of giants when I began to think and write about American ways of war. Indeed, military historians, much more accomplished than me, have long sought to describe Americans' approach to war. Russell, we Russell F. Wigley has been the most influential of the scholars to suggest that Americans have created a singular military heritage. Indeed, his seminal book, The American Way of War, established the paradigm that most scholars use to explain the American military tradition. I propose that the way of war I will explain tonight offers an alternative understanding to Wigley's, one based on the proposition that war focused on non-combatant populations is itself a fundamental part of America's military past, indeed is America's first way of war. Before I delve into describing the first way of war, I need to offer you a critique of the Wigley thesis. And those of you in the War College curriculum will no doubt encounter the Wigley thesis many times over the next 10 months or the remaining period of your, your course of study here. Wigley's foundational argument, and with it the accepted synthesis of American military history, rests on two conceptual pillars, both the products of post-Napoleonic German scholarship. First, he continued to, contended that Karl von Clausewitz on war defines in general terms the parameters within which we can understand America's military culture. Clausewitz distinguished between two kinds of wars, those that seek to overthrow the enemy and those that seek merely to achieve a limited victory. Wigley asserted that all American military history falls in that framework. In America's earliest wars, he argued, English colonists and later the United States proved too weak to pursue anything other than limited wars. As time went on, an American's military might grew. However, Americans increasingly fought unlimited wars to overthrow their enemies. The Civil War, especially William T. Sherman's March to the Sea, symbolized how Americans embraced the Clausewitzian conception of the complete destruction of the enemy as a goal of war. The second part of Wigley's thesis derived from his understanding of another German military philosopher and historian, Hans Delbruck. Delbruck suggested that there are two kinds of military strategy, the strategy of annihilation, which seeks to erase an enemy's military power in a thunderclap of violence, and the strategy of attrition, which attempts to erode it. If you'll humor me here with a brief sidebar, I should point out that a third strategic operation, option, excuse me, available to modern soldiers is that of strategic paralysis. Strategic paralysis originated with the armored warfare theorists such as J.F.C. Fuller and B.H. Liddell Hart in the 1920s and 30s. The goal of strategic paralysis is to attrit and annihilate the enemy's ability to resist by forcing his command and control, excuse me, by focusing on his command and control and sustainment capabilities. Modern air power theorists, especially those in the United States Air Force, has ado have adopted strategic paralysis as their mantra. Strategic paralysis can be gained through simultaneous or parallel attacks on an enemy's center of gravity, all very Clausewitzian when you talk about centers of gravity. Early American soldiers naturally did not have the technology that would allow for parallel war. As such, their strategic operations necessarily were only attritive or annihilationist. Back to the Wigley thesis. He argued that most modern American military, strategi American military strategists have preferred Delbrookian wars of annihilation in closing with the enemy for the quote-unquote decisive battle. In fact, one of Wigley's books is The Quest for Decisive Battle. He suggested that when American military resources were limited, Americans adopted strategies of attrition out of necessity. But the abundance of economic resources characteristic of the United States from the mid-19th century onward, coupled with the adoption of Clausewitzian unlimited war aims, created an environment in which the strategy of annihilation became the American way of war. Wigley's synthesis of Clausewitz and Delbruck therefore led him to see American military history 
through a lens that focuses only on the complete destruction of the enemy through annihilation of the enemy's military power. Two features of Wigley's account, however, limits its explanatory power and range. First, it is disjunctive. Wigley established a demarcation between American wars before and after 1846, similar to the break that we sometimes assume separates colonial from later American history. He saw America's pre-Mexican war conflicts as limited attritional wars. Thereafter, Americans turned to an approach more in line with the unlimited annihilationist model. Wigley suggested, for example, that a lack of military resources influenced George Washington and Nathaniel Green's commitment to limited attritional strategies in the war for independence. Thus, while, creating, while crediting Green with creating an American conception of guerrilla war, he contended, quote, the latter course of American military history, featuring a rapid rise from poverty of resources to plenty, cuts short any further American evolution of Green's type of strategy. He therefore remains alone as an American master developing a strategy of unconventional warfare, unquote. The assumption that colonial military history differs significantly from what followed led Wigley with his focus on post mid 19th century American war to minimize continuity and evolution in America's military past in favor of an abrupt and quote unquote revolutionary departure from previous norms and institutions. Wigley's tendency to privilege the affairs of regular armies over the actions and attitudes of non-professional soldiers marks the second limiting, second limiting characteristic of his argument. His subject was primarily the formal entity of the United States Army, or in the case of the colonial period, the British Army. Wigley's approach to military history centered on organizations, major campaigns, doctrinal thinking, and diplomacy. From it, he explained superbly the grand strategy and policy of the United States Army. Americans, however, had served and fought outside professional military organizations for nearly one and three quarter centuries before the Army came into existence in 1775. And while many Americans found their way to both the British and the United States armies, many more fought as Indian fighters, as members of ad hoc organizations, formed sp for specific operations, and disbanded at their conclusion. Thus, Wigley's thesis is unable to provide more than a few incidental insights into the non-army aspects of the American military experience. If we look closely at American military history, we see it had less to do with grand strategy, the movements of armies, or the clash of nations than with what 18th century writers call petty guerre. War in early America among Americans, Indians, Britons, Canadians, Frenchmen, and Spaniards consisted of a multitude of little wars and quasi-personal struggles. Although in the 1690s the colonists became embroiled in the century-long series of Anglo-French conflicts that historians sometimes call the Second Hundred Years' War, Americans fought those wars for different periods, excuse me, for different ends. While great European armies fought for dynastic and geopolitical goals in Europe, handfuls of colonists waged life and death struggles against Indians and Canadians on the American frontier. Without a Vauban style of web fortifications and magazines covering the land, or the massive armies like those engaged at Lutzen, Blenheim, and Malwitz, petty guerre remained supreme. Uh, second sidebar is in order here. Of course, there were Vauban style forts in North America. Louisburg on Cape Breton Island and St. Augustine of Florida, for example, would have fit in as middle-sized European forts. The difference was that American forts stood independently of one another, whereas in Europe they belonged to fortification and magazine systems. In fact, almost, war almost all warfare between quote-unquote regular armies conducted in early America was siege warfare. There were then two kinds of military endeavors in colonial North America. Siege and fortress war on one hand, the province of regular soldiers, British troops or militia formed in provincial regiments, and petty guerre on the other, the purview of Indians, rangers, backwoodsmen, and the troops de la marine of New France. Moreover, Americans' use of petty guerre did not end with the colonial era's wars. A series of small but brutal wars between frontiersmen and Indians ran concurrently with the War of Independence in the Trans-Appalachian West and along the New York frontier. Similarly, the first military operations of the United States in the 1790s were not wars typical of the state-centered struggles occurring in Europe at that time. We need to remember that the 1790s, early 1800s, were the age of Napoleonic warfare with massive armies in Europe. The American wars were primarily conflicts waged against Indians on the frontier that only occasionally, and usually reluctantly, 
involved the participation of the United States Army. Even in the 18-teens, the period that most historians credit with signaling the birth of a professional American Army, Petty Gear proved as, if not more, important than the operations of that Army in the American conquest of the Old Northwest and the Old Southwest. The Old Northwest, of course, being today what we call the Midwest, and the Old Southwest being Alabama, Mississippi, that region. For the first 200 years of our military heritage then, Americans depended on arts of war that contemporary professional soldiers supposedly abhorred, raising and destroying enemy villages and fields, killing enemy women and children, raiding, raiding settlements for captives, intimidating and brutalizing enemy non-combatants, and assassinating enemy leaders. Why then did Wagley's thesis not address the that ubiquitous, albeit darker, side of the American military history experience. The answer would seem that like the German theorists on whose work he drew, he tended to see professional military behavior and organization as normative. Clausewitz's service on the Russian general staff in 1812, in which he witnessed firsthand the horrifying behavior of the Tsar's Cossacks, led to his repudiation of their methods as an inferior as well as an ineffectual way to fight. Clausewitz argued that war, rightly understood, was the rational instrument of national policy. Those of you in war college obviously are going to find that war is the extension of politics through other means. That's pretty much approaching the same idea, right? He wrote, if civilized nations, quote, if civilized nations do not put their prisoners to death, do not devastate towns and countries, that is because their intelligence exercises greater influence on their mode of carrying on war and has taught them more effectual means of applying force than these rude acts of mere instinct, unquote. Delbruck was a Prussian nationalist interested in chronicling the 19th century wars of German unification. He emphatically shared Clausewitz's belief that war fell within the purview of a legitimate nation-state action. Weigley's thesis embeds both Clausewitz's revulsion at indiscriminate violence and Delbruck's focus on national war throughout its analysis. In fact, writing in Makers of Modern Strategy, Wigley contended that, quote, historians may tend to exaggerate the readiness of early Americans to turn toward absolute war, end quote. These assumptions led Wigley to discount the kind of war that early Americans waged as abnormal or unworthy of serious consideration. In the process, Wigley created, like the military theorists who preceded him, an artificial dichotomy between, quote, unquote, regular and, quote, unquote, irregular war and organization. In Wigley's paradigm, the frontier wars against Indians are relatively unimportant. He saw American military history following the path of Clawitzian Delbruckian evolution from mid 19th century to its ultimate manifestation in World War II. In reality, the American way of war traveled an evolutionary route that began with the first days of European settlement in the early 17th century and stretched well into the 19th century. Wigley's interpretation continues to bestride American military historiography like a colossus. Military historians have been unable to move far beyond it, and instead they argue over shades of beige rather than advance a new synthesis on the place of early war making in the broader American military tradition. My approach in the first wave of war, therefore, is to examine the whole of the early American military experience from 1607 through 1814 by addressing a series of questions. First, and centrally, how did Americans develop a way of war that was both unlimited in its ends and irregular in its means? And how did that way of war change over time? Second, what cultural, social, and military experiences and perceptions informed America's understanding and practice of war making? Similarly, which groups within American society participated in those wars and why did they choose or feel required to do so? Finally, how and in what ways was early American war making distinctive? And there's a gigantic debate, a huge debate, that American exceptionalism, that America is somehow a unique, distinct nation. We have a unique, distinct historical experience, and that shapes our, shapes our cultural identity. So part of what I'm looking at here is using military history as an attempt to discuss the issue of American exceptionalism. The answers to those questions comprise my central argument. Early Americans created a military tradition that accepted, legitimized, and encouraged attacks upon 
and the destruction of non-combatants, villages, and agricultural resources. Most often, early Americans used the tactics and techniques of petty guerre and shockingly violent campaigns to achieve their goals of conquest. In the frontier wars between 1607 and 1814, Americans forged two elements, unlimited war and irregular war, into their first way of war. I support that thesis by tracing the evolutionary path of the first way of war across two centuries. In the book, each of the seven chapters focuses on a point in the development of American war making. In that sense, I intend each to stand alone as an argument addressing a specific issue in early American military history. The sum of the chapters, however, I hope forms a narrative greater than its individual parts to address three unresolved issues in early American history. First, and most obviously, the storyline points to the importance of the first wave of war in early American military history. It shows that it was Americans' quote-unquote first wave of war, both temporally and in terms of preference. Attacking and destroying Indian non-combatant populations remained Americans, particularly frontiersmen's, preferred way of war from the early 16th through early 19th centuries, even after the formation of the regular American army and its attempts to move toward the 18th century European norm of limited war. Second, it seeks to explain the extravagant violence of the American Indian conflicts and their tendency to become unrestrained struggles for the complete destruction of the enemy. Most explanations for the Indian War's brutality focus on racism. American racism towards Indians, however, did not solidify into the middle of the 18th century, and their first extirpative wars occurred nearly a generation before Americans' negative racial views of Indians began to emerge. Many American soldiers, in fact, admired Indians in the ways they fought. The two quote-unquote races often fought alongside one another as allies. Thus, an explanation that complements, not supplants, that of race centers on the uncontrollable momentum of violence that the first way of war fueled. Instead of race leading to violence, in early America, violence led to race. From both military necessity and hands-on experience, success successive generations of Americans, both soldiers and civilians, made the killing of Indian men, women, and children a defining element of their first military tradition and they are part, therefore part of a shared American identity. Indeed, only after 17th and early 18th century Americans made the first way of war a key to being a quote-unquote white American could a later generation of Indian haters, men like Andrew Jackson, turn the Indian wars into race wars. Third, my book shows how the first way of war became America's preferred tool of conquest. Both contemporaries and students of early American history have observed that the first settlers were an imperialistic lot. They, at times methodically and at other times haphazardly, conquered the Indian peoples of the eastern seaboard, the French, Spanish, and Indians in the marshlands of Nova Scotia and Georgia, aided in Great Britain's conquest of the French in Canada, and subjugated the Indians of the Trans-Appalachian West. The one consistent roadblock to the settlers' expansion into the interior of the continent was always the Indians. Thus, if they could eliminate the Indians, the settlers could make North America their own. Limited wars like those conceived by European dynastic states, including Great Britain, however, did little to drive the Indians from their lands. Americans thus chose the most effective means of subjugating the Indians they faced. They sent groups of men, sometimes a dozen, sometimes hundreds, to attack Indian villages and homes, kill Indian women and children, and raise Indian fields. America's improvised this way of war long before significant numbers of British troops arrived in the colonies in the middle of the 18th century. The challenges of fighting Indians that confronted 17th and early 18th century Americans led them to, to direct their military energies towards killing non-combatants and destroying agricultural resources. The colonists embraced three practices, extirpative war making, the creation of specialized units for Indian fighting, also known as rangers, and the use of scalp hunters to motivate privatized, commercialized campaign through the issues of scalp bounties that provided the pillars upon which the first wave of war rested. Rangers, the key practitioners of the first wave of war, and I'm sure, as Mike mentioned, many of you in the Air War College student body wear a ranger tab these days, first appeared on the colonial military scene in the late 17th century in New England and Virginia. Before King Philip's War, 1675 to 76 in New England, in the Susquehannock War, 1675 to 76 in Virginia, 
The colonists delegated responsibility for military affairs to a cadre of European professional soldiers, men such as John Smith and Miles Standish, who we all learned about in our fourth grade history classes over the uh, celebration of Thanksgiving, right? The mercenaries' use of European methods of warfare proved, from the Indians' perspective, devastatingly effective in Virginia's continuing conflict with the Powhatan Co Confederacy, the Anglo-Powhatan War of 1609 to 14, the First Indian War of 1622 to 32, and the Tidewater War of 1644 and 46, as well as New England's War with the Pequots in 1637-38. And I understand that's a long list of dates. The important point to remember is early Americans are near continually at war with their neighbors. By the mid-1670s, however, early Euro-Americans' consistent use of unlimited strategies and tactics precipitated significant changes in the Indian ways of war. The Indian as the enemy were adopting, adapting. Excuse me. The spread of firearms among the Indians, a revolution in Indian tactics, and the stark changes in Indi Indian strategy from quote-unquote limited wars to feral unlimited wars made European methods of war making of little value. Colonists on the frontier quickly grasped that the most effective means to defend their homes was to employ companies of rangers skilled in what today we would call special operations. The rangers became identified with a way of war in which they burned villages and fields and killed Indian combatants and non-combatants alike. The focus on ranging, what Europeans again called petty guerre, dominated Anglo-American conceptualizations of war through King's William's War, 1689-97, Queen Anne's War, 1702-14, the Tuscarora War, 1711 to 13, the Yamasee War, 1715 to 18, and Dummer's War, 1722 to 27. Again, early Americans are continually at war with their Indian neighbors. Indeed, in Dummer's War, we can see the first way of war reaching a clearly definable form thanks to the actions of Captain John Lovewell. We hear much about Robert Rogers being the father of the American Ranger tradition. Captain John Lovewell was a Ranger earlier, a generation earlier than Robert Rogers even considered being a ranger. Lovell was raised in a family with a long pedigree of Indian fighters, and in Dummer's War, which is also known as Lovewell's War, he petitioned the General Assembly of Massachusetts for a commission to take 40 or 50 frontiersmen on a scalp hunting expedition into Maine. Lovewell wrote that he was, quote, inclined to range and to keep out in the woods for several months together in order to kill and destroy their, any, their enemy Indians provided they, meaning his rangers, can meet with encouragement suitable, end quote. Lovewell was confident that he would find Indians sufficient in sufficient numbers to kill. For wages, Lovewell considered five shillings per day appropriate for one year of Indian hunting. And if they failed to kill any Indians, his rangers agreed to accept no compensation from the colony. Well, that's pretty interesting. These men are willing to go out to spend a year fighting in the woods of Maine, in the wilds of Maine, and accept no compensation if they don't kill any of the enemy. I'm still not sure exactly what to make of that, to be honest with you. The assembly authorized Lovewell and his men two shillings, six pence per day, half of what they asked for, but granted them an incentive of 100 pounds for each male scalp that they returned to Boston. Considering that the average wage at that time was about six pence a day, a hundred pounds, is a tremendous fortune if you were to uh, be so lucky as to find an enemy Indian to scope, or an Indian to scope. Let's leave it at that. Lovewell's first expedition met with almost immediate success. After filling his ranks of his company with experienced backwoodsmen, Lovewell led his scalp hunters into the wilds of Maine. On December 10th, 1724, Lovewell's men came upon a wigwam where two Indians, a man and a young boy, were sleeping. Lovewell's men killed them, scalped them, and returned triumphantly to Boston where they received 200 pounds plus two shillings, six pence a day for their troubles. Encouraged by his success, Lovewell enlisted 88 men for a second expedition. On February 9, 1725, the scalp hunters crossed the trail of 10 Indians near Lake Winnipesaukee in current day New Hampshire. After tracking them for 11 days, so they tracked these Indians for 11 days in the middle of the New England winter, they caught up with them just before sunset on the 20th. Lovewell waited until near midnight to spring his ambush. The Americans killed the Indians. Again, the men of Lovewell's company scalped their victims, took their possessions, and returned to Dover, where they sold the dead Indians' guns for seven pounds each and collected a fortune 
1,000 pounds from the public treasury. The three pillars of the first wave of war, extirpative war making, rangers, and scout bounties were clearly in place. It was that kind of war, essentially war focused on non-combatants and combatants alike, that intersected with old world military practices in the 1740s. Most 18th century professional British Army officers generally disparaged the military acumen of the rangers and Indian fighters. Today, right, many regular military officers, conventional non-soft officers disparage the discipline, at least, of the rangers. Not much changes over 250 years. Yet, in the North American Wars of King George II, which lasted from 1739 to 1755, a small cadre of British soldiers and administrators became deeply involved with fighting Indians in North America. They quickly discovered the inadequacy of their European approaches to making war. In the War of Jenkins' Ear, 1739-1742, and I'm sure you're all an expert on the War of Jenkins' Ear, right? Another well-known war in American history. King George's War, 1744-48, and the obscure conflict in Nova Scotia that preceded the Seven Years' War, an episode I have called Father Lelute's War, which lasted from 1749 to 1754, British administrators and commanders turned to Americans to wage the first wave of war. In doing the British Army's quote-unquote dirty work, that is killing and capturing women and children in burning fields and villages, a stable of Americans emerged as war heroes. In Georgia, Brigadier General James Oglethorpe, the founder of the colony of Georgia, on more than one occasion credited his American rangers in their approach to fighting with saving the colony from Indian and Spanish depredations. In the north, John Gorham, who as a reward for his important service in Nova Scotia, received a commission as a regular officer in the British Army. Excuse me, in the north, John Gorham received a commission as a regular officer in the British Army. Gorham's claim to fame was the brutal yet effective war that he waged on the Acadian civilians of Nova Scotia. He proved he had little compunction for killing Indians and Acadian non-combatants, and in one case he received a bounty for a blonde scalp. Not a whole lot of Indians who are blonde. As long as the Americans were the ones soiling their hands with the first wave of war, British officers generally had little concerns about how waging war on non-combatants affected the reputation of the army. Ironically, or perhaps hypocritically, depending on your view, British soldiers were not completely ignorant of the kind of war manifested in the first wave of war. British soldiers who served in Ireland and Scotland had by the middle of the 18th century created a corpus of knowledge on irregular warfare that was rooted in both experience and theory. We need not forget that the British faced the Jacobite rebellions of 1715 and 1745, and they brutally suppressed those rebellions. The British model of petty guerre, however, differed from the American variety in one crucial way. In Britain, petty gear was the bastard child of a military culture that found it useful within limits, but so, is, so distasteful as to be unworthy of an acknowledgement as an acceptable mode of military operations. In America, it was a key component to the primary means of waging war. Simply put, American war making eventuated in a martial culture strongly shaped by North American circumstances and thus quite different from the model upon which British soldiers operated. The Seven Years' War of 1754 to 1763 was a watershed event for the first wave of war. The war legitimized the first wave of war within British military circles. In the late 1750s, the British government for the first time sent large numbers of regulars to North America. We need to remember that until the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War, Americans did most of their fighting on their own. There were very few British Army officers or troops in the colonies. The old prejudices against Americans and their fighting abilities remain. General Jeffrey Amherst's assertion that, quote, if left to themselves, they would eat fried pork and lay in their tents all day long, unquote, is only one of the many caustic remarks that senior British officers made concerning their American auxiliaries and allies. But, Faced with a shortage of Indian allies, and in most cases disdaining those that presented themselves, the British turned to American rangers in the first wave of war to fight the French troops de la Marine, the colonial regulars of New France who had mastered Indian-style warfare. In time, the rangers' woodland fighting and scouting skills enabled the British Army to operate effectively in the wilds of North America without fear of an Indian ambush like that which befell Edward Braddock's army in 1755. The greatest hero of the empire to emerge from the war, the martyr General James Wolfe, who died on the Plains of Abraham outside Quebec, embraced the first wave of war wholeheartedly. And Wolfe is not a particularly 
um, likable character in history. He has many issues, but one issue that he did understand was the use of terror warfare against his adversaries. He turned both his regulars and irregulars on the Canadians in a bid to terrorize them into submission. Captain Joseph Gorham, the younger brother of John Gorham, who had won fame in Father Lelute's war, led his rangers in destroying every building except the churches for over 90 miles on the south bank of the St. Lawrence River. Okay, they destroyed, uh, uh, that's incredibly profound, I think, every building except the churches for a 90-mile swath of destruction. In the best-known atrocity of Wolf's campaign, Captain Alexander Montgomery and a detachment of the 43rd Regiment that is, regular soldiers killed and then scalped a priest and 30 parishioners at worship at the village of St. Anne. No matter how distasteful, Americans and Britons alike had found that the first way of war was useful. The most famous American to emerge from the war, Major Robert Rogers, was indistinguishable from the first way of war. Rogers' most famous exploit was a raid that served as little more than a revenge mission deep into enemy-controlled territory. In the autumn of 1759, Rogers commanded a party of 200 rangers and regulars bent on destroying the Abenaki Indian village of St. Francis, just south of Montreal. The raid had little tactical or operational utility, and it stood as little more than a reckoning of accounts for generations of warfare on the New England frontier between Yankees and Abenakis. While historians continue to debate the details of what actually happened at St. Francis, Rogers claimed that he and his men had killed over 200 Abenakis. He boasted that the rangers shot women and children who tried to escape in their canoes, and they burned the village and its granary to the ground. More telling, the public acclaim in both England and America that Rogers received was tremendous. He received a meeting with the king and a lucrative contract for his memoirs. No longer was the first way of war something to be kept in the shadows. The British heroes of the Seven Years' War, Amherst, Wolfe, and Rogers, all had acknowledged the first way of war as a legitimate endeavor. The first way of war remained America's preferred approach to fighting Indians on the frontier throughout the Revolutionary period. Indeed, a focus on the Indian Wars instead of the affairs of the Continental Army and the well-trodden partisan war in the southern and middle colonies gives us an alternative vantage point which, from which to view the first years of the United States military history. The Sullivan-Clinton campaign of 1779 in the western New York in which the American forces hoped to, quote, totally extirpate the unfriendly nation of Indians to subdue their country, destroy their crops, and drive them to seek habitations where they would be less troublesome to us and our allies, unquote, stands as a powerful reminder that Americans, by the year of the Revolution, had ways of war beyond that proposed by George Washington in the regular Continental Army. The first way of war was never the only way of war. It was the first way of war. There are second and third ways of war. By examining the destruction and devastation that Americans inflicted on the Iroquois, Cherokees, and Chickamaugas during the War of Independence, we can see the revolutionary period not so much as the beginning of a new American way of regular war, but as another chapter in the history of the first way of war. More important, a focus on the first way of war puts the revolutionary period's military history in context with the years that preceded 1775, and those that followed 1783, the bookends of the American War for Independence. The First Wave War remained alive and well into the Federalist era. Most studies of military affairs in that era focus on civil military affairs and the creation of the United States Army. Historians normally dismiss backcountry settlers burning of Indian villages and, villages and fields as a sideshow to the Army's attempt to mold itself into a force like those found in Europe. Again, this is the period of the Napoleonic Wars. Wars of the French Revolution. Yet the wars in the upper Ohio Valley and on the Tennessee and western Georgia frontiers are vitally important excuse me, to understanding the evolution of Americans' military heritage. It is significant that as the federal government and army failed to secure the 1790s frontier, backcountry settlers, tiring of what they saw of governmental and army incompetence, focused their energies on destroying Indian villages and food supplies. They were unabashed in declaring that their intentions were to drive the Indians from the lands on the western side of the Appalachian Range and claim those lands as their own, whether or not the nation state of the United States wanted them to do so or not. Georgia frontiersmen, for instance, waged war against Creek Indians in the early 1790s by raiding their villages, burning their fields, and killing their women and children. 
In time, the federal government joined in the wars against the Indians. Mad Anthony Wayne's campaign against the Ohio Indians in 1794, in which his troops, following the skirmish at Fallen Timbers, quote, by easy marches laid waste to villages and cornfields for about 50 miles on each side of the Miami River, unquote, suggests the permanence of the first wave of war in American strategic planning and operations. The first wave of war reaches apogee in the 18-teens. It, more than any other factor, shaped Americans' approach to the Indian Wars in the Old Northwest and Old Southwest. For the second time in as many generations, American frontiersmen wearied of the Army's inability and willingness to drive the Indians from their lands, from the lands of the Trans-Appalachian West, and the frontiersmen took matters into their own hands. Two men who later leveraged their experience fighting Indians into the presidency, William Henry Harrison and Andrew Jackson, were relentless in their destruction of Indian villages and fields. Jackson, at the end of the Creek War in 1814, told his enemies that, quote, we Americans bleed our enemies in such cases to give them their senses, was high, hardly hyperbole. Between 1810 and 1814, American arms literally and figuratively bled white the Indian peoples of the Old Northwest and Old Southwest. After 1814, the entire area east of the Mississippi River was open to American settlement. The frontiersmen who won the West had won the frontier just as the settlers of New England, the Tidewater of Virginia, and the Carolina, Carolinas had won their frontier in the early 17th century. They used the first wave of war. The first wave of war lost its central place in American war making after 1814. No longer needing it to conquer the Indian peoples of the eastern half of the continent, American military history could embark on the path that led to a second wave of war, one that we today call the American way of war, Russell Wigley's thesis. Still, Americans must not forget that the first way of war has remained a part of their military heritage. Whether in the Indian Wars of the 19th century, the Civil War, the strategic bombing campaigns against Nazi Germany and Japan in World War II, or the Vietnam War, Americans often blurred and even erased the boundaries between combatants and non-combatants. That has been less a part of a Clawitzian, Delbruckian synthesis than a living legacy of the first wave war. In the final analysis, I believe that we, both as students of history and practitioners of the profession of arms, if we hope to understand completely the nature of our martial culture, we must begin by acknowledging the centrality of the first wave war to America's military past. By seeing that it served as both a component and unique part of the American military culture from the start, we may acquire a better grasp of how Americans have waged and possibly will wage war. I hope my book, my talk tonight, will illuminate an uncharted region in early American military history and fill the gaps in Wigley's masterful yet incomplete, incomplete interpretation of our military past. I believe our attempts to find the roots of modern American war making can then begin with our earliest military experiences. From there, we will be able to identify, rather than merely presume, elements of continuity and change across the entire course of American military history. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions you'd like to ask Dr. Grenier before we uh, wrap up here, please raise your hand and uh, you see where my mouth is in relation to the microphone. Wait till we get to, the, get to you with the microphone because we want to capture your question, both for all of us here and for everybody who's going to be watching on the internet very soon. So if you have questions, please raise your hand and we'll have a microphone on each side of the room. Yes, sir, please. Would you say it's fair, it's fair to say that the uh, first way of war was primarily in, uh, supported by civilians or frontiersmen? They were a very critical el element in that, in that method? Yes, sir. I mean, it is, it is a militia man's war. Um, there, there's a spectrum of military service in early America. There are professional, regular troops, primarily Britons, who serve in those troops. And then on the far end of the spectrum, there are militiamen. Um, some militiamen will join in units that support the British professional troops. We'll call those troops provincials. And then sliding down the spectrum, there will be the rangers and then just regular kind of Indian fighting militia and then the straight natural militia that we think of going out on the village green and, you know, firing the cannon once a year and drinking plenty of grog to, to celebrate the grand time. So, yes, this is, this is a... a 
non-professional soldier's way of war. You would join one of these ranger companies, like in the case of Lovewell's rangers, you would join them for the specific campaign and then be disbanded at the end of that year, 10 months, six weeks, however long that, that campaign was scheduled to last for. That, that's a point that Fred Anderson makes in his book, A People's Army, when uh, your enlistment is up, you get to go home. It doesn't matter if you're in the middle of the campaign. If you're in the middle of upstate New York getting ready to go against Fort Ticonderoga, if your enlistment inspire, expires on October 1st, you're going home at the end of September. You're not, doesn't matter if the Army's engaged or not, your commitment's up. You've met your contractual principle. Um, to what degree is the first way of war reactionary, dependent on how the enemy fights? I think very much so is reactionary. Um, the first, as I mentioned in the talk, the, the first colonies trust their military operations in the hands of men like John Smith in Virginia, Miles Standish, John Underhall, um, John Mason, all these professional soldiers. These professional soldiers are incredibly devastatingly effective against the Indian enemy. Because what they're doing is they're building, uh, they're building armies that destroy Indian fields and crops. And at that point, Indians changed their tactics and stopped fighting limited wars, because that's what Indians thought of. They thought of limited war, and they start fighting unlimited war. And that really comes to the surface in King Philip's War, where they basically, the Indians basically kill one-tenth of the population of colonial New England. So the colonists go, boy, we need to do something else to strike at these enemies. And the only way we can do that, we can't meet them in the field, so we'll destroy their villages. And the best way to get them to stop is to kill their women and children. So it is completely reactionary in my view. Second question. Would you consider uh, Simeon Nakaya's uh, concept of using smallpox uh, as an effective weapon against the Indians, does that fall into the category of the first way of war? Very much so. I, yeah. Amherst and his favorite, um, his favorite quote is, I hope to exterminate the bastards, give them the smallpox, and I don't have to send an army out there, hopefully they'll all die of infectious disease. Biological warfare, if you will. Um, from what I understand, you seem to be saying that the 1810s was, I think you called it the apogee of the first way of war. Um, I was wondering how you would categorize the Indian wars that happened after the Civil War, like the Sand Creek Massacre, the Wounded Knee Massacre, and things like that. What right. elements of those would you consider first a way of war or second way of war or so on? Right. There's, um, there's an issue with what, th there's a policy shift, if you will, about the 1830s with the, the era of Indian removal from the East to the Indian territories. The Army um, in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s out on the frontier during with, dealing with the Western Indians, they decide to not extirpate them, which is basically the 18th century word for exterminate. They decide to put them on reservations. So there's, there's a shift in the poli policy. We, we hear a lot about, you know, um, Philip Sheridan and his army and Sherman and their army. They're, they're killing the buffalo to exterminate the Indians. I don't think they were trying to exterminate the Indians. I think they were trying to control them. Um, if, you know, the Dakota and the Arapahoes and the, the Cheyennes had bumped into men like John Gorham and John Lovewell and Robert Rogers, it would have been a completely different outcome. But then again, America is looking forward to the 20th century in the 1870s and 1880s. We're no longer this rough frontier society that would tolerate um, extirpation of the Indian enemies. There's the whole concept of the noble savage. You know, there's relief agencies in the West saying, stop waging war so violently on the Indians. We'll create the Carlisle Indian School, correct, to, to try to reform these Indians and make them behave like whites. Um, so there, there is a fundamental difference. No matter how brutal those Indian wars were, I don't think they're as brutal as the ones that preceded them in the 17th and 18th century. John, I'm curious about one thing in your comment. Um, I'm curious a little bit how the American way of war ties to the tribal warfare that existed in America long before the first conflict, particularly 
uh, as the Confederation of the Iroquois starts to form and the annihilation of the Erie, uh, right. the Creek and Cherokee Wars, and then subsequently the Cherokee and the Iroquois War, these were also wars of annihilation. How does that fit to the mold of what you're defining as the American way of war? Right. The, the Beaver Wars of the 1660s and 1690s were the most per capita, the most destructive wars in American history in which the, the Iroquois basically waged war against all their enemies to control the beaver trade. Um, what I'm saying here is that Anglo-Americans embrace that concept and were willing to use Indians as their proxies in that, in that kind of war. I'm not saying that the, the American way of war, the first way of war, is unique, distinctly American. Um, and I'm not excusing the, and that's a lot of criticism I've gotten from folks on the right, is that I'm somehow excusing Indian wars and their brutality. I'm not saying that at all. Those were horrific affairs. But what I'm trying to do is look at the specific, definable American way of war from the Anglo-American settlers. Does that make sense? Yeah, do you feel, though, that the Americans have taken on maybe some of that tribal aspect of warfare, that it's a learned aspect that the Americans are taking on? Right. I, I think very much so that they see, you know, in the South, for example, they see the... Yeah, the, the Catawbas, right? I mean, they're waging war on all of their neighbors, and the Americans find them as good Indians, and we can use those to attack everybody else, attack the Yamases, attack the Tuscaroras. Yes, I have a question. I can't most see you. I'm sorry. <laughs> most of the time when oh. the Native Americans would win, it was not considered a victory. Right. But yet when the European-Americans won, it was a victory. Why the difference? I think the issue is that um, Anglo-Americans, Euro-Americans are focused on conquest. Um, so essentially, if you look at what Native Americans or Indians are doing, they're putting in a position where they had to fight a rear guard action from 1607, 1609, all the way until they're basically put on the reservation system or conquered. So um, the American identity, right, is that we're going to win the West, right? And we're going to, American, white America, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant America, if you will, has created this identity that we spread civilization and light and goodness across the frontier. Well, in reality, civilization, light, and goodness might have come but it was only after the rangers went out there and killed Indian women and children and burned their fields. And that's why you would define that as a victory. It's a, it's a victory for the idea of progress. And that's, you know, that's Eurocentric and an arrogant idea that only white Europeans understand the concept of progress. Does that answer your question? Sort of? Okay. I wonder to what extent you consider that the first way of war uh, has been reflected in or integrated into American approaches to the codification of the laws of war. Uh, that, that's one of the issues I, I discuss in, uh, in the book. I really couldn't go into it here. Um, there, there's a revulsion to it. Um, when people start looking at what happened, um, Europeans are the first to do this following the, the, uh, the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 48. You get the laws of war. In the 18th century is the age of European limited warfare, right? And Americans are going off waging this first way of war. When we create a professional standing army about 1815, um, there's no place for that first way of war kind of behavior anymore. And, right, you get the ideas of proportionality, issues like that. So it's, it's more a revulsion of it that is incorporated in the way we, we view the world as a military. Um, I, I was a grad student of Russ Wagley's from 79 to 81, and uh, he and I remained in close contact for uh, the subsequent 25 years and, until he died. And I think I can say with certainty that he would um, congratulate you for writing a very important and very necessary prequel to his, his major work. He was, he was incredibly supportive of me when, mm -hmm. I, was, when I was doing this. A, I, a real I gentleman. Have, I do have one quick question. Uh, wh where do you see the strategic bombings of Germany and Japan as perhaps a lingering manifestation of the first way of war? I, I think it just fits into a, a pattern of where you gain, where you reach a level of frustration because you cannot strike at the enemy's regular force. 
you can't meet his fielded army, you go after his civilians. You go after his infrastructure. And when we start the strategic bombing, right, 1942, 1943, there are no American troops on the continent to fight the Wehrmacht or we're not able to fight the Imperial Japanese Army. So we're going we're gonna to firebomb their cities. Can you draw a contrast or a parallel between the first way of war and what Al-Qaeda and the Taliban are doing today? I, I think it's, it's a military strategy of the week. Um, again, the same issue we had dealing with Nazi Germany in 1942-1943. We could not strike their regular army. Al-Qaeda, the Taliban cannot strike our regular army. The issue is trying to control the populace, right? We hear so much about winning hearts and minds. Well, sometimes you don't have to win hearts and minds. The first wave war had no interest in winning hearts and minds. If you kill all the hearts and all the minds, you don't have to worry about winning them. So, um, yeah, I think it's a military strategy of the week, and I think it's a, it's a military strategy of desperation, to be honest with you. Now, I don't know if, if saying it's a military strategy of desperation, if that means that... Uh, we will necessarily have success in Iraq and Afghanistan in defeating Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. But uh, I think in the long run, um, it's not, in the, in the long run in the modern world, it's not going to attain the same outcomes that it did in the colonial period. <coughs> Sir, first of all, I have to admit, I haven't read your book. Didn't even know of it, but... I certainly have learned that today. I, I, I won't hold that against you. I accidentally <laughs> came to do some research today and found out about your, your lecture tonight and stayed on. I was wondering, in the book, did you, or prior to it, did you, did you consider the Spanish and the Catholic Church behind the Spanish and their handling of the Indian populations to, you know, in such gross manner that that may have been the, and do you feel that may have been part of what set the whole stage and tenor of, of the Indians' attitude toward anyone of a Caucasian countenance and also maybe set precedence for the, for the other Caucasians, both the English and the French, although the French often were very good with the Indians. Right. They liked their, the Indian ladies. <laughs> right. And they intermarried and so forth, but more so than others, I would say. But in other words, do sure. you think that that had something to do with the I, mindset for this, for this sort of warfare. I, I went down a, a rat hole in my uh, PhD dissertation. I, I, there's a whole section about um, Spaniards employing wolf hounds against Indians and hunting them down like you would hunt down deer in the American South. Um, I don't think Anglo-Americans, that is, Americans and Englishmen who came from the British Isles, would have adopted Spanish ways um, because there was such a vehement dislike and hatred of Catholicism. Right. That was a defining element of the, the English Protestant worldview. Um, but I think they had no issue not separating Indians from Spaniards. They thought Indians and Spaniards were the same. So what's good for an Indian is good for a Spaniard. Um, when they get into Nova Scotia, you know, they're, it, it's, you talk about race. Um, when they get in Nova Scotia, when they're waging war on the Acadians, the Acadians look exactly like them. They're the same people. They're, they're of European extraction. But the point is, they're Catholic, and they've allied themselves, as you mentioned, with Indians. They've intermarried with them. They have all these Métis children. So because they've done that, they violated the proper rules of behavior. Therefore, it's okay to burn their villages and kill their women and children. And I, I would say rape their women and children, but um, there's, it's hard to find evidence of, um, in the documentary evidence, most people don't run around admitting to committing rape, but it's hard to find that evidence in the, in the record, but I suspect one of the things that went along with this brutality was the use of rape. But I, I can't prove that. 
Spain, Spain really didn't have a presence in, in North America much north of, uh, um, yeah, much north of New Mexico, or San Antonio, if you will. Sir. Um, you mentioned how the annihilative aspect of this method of warfare we continue to see in the 20th century in terms of the bombing of Germany and Japan. Um, is this more a regular aspect of the first way of war reflected in the modern focus, especially on special forces, just about every branch of the military, Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, paratroopers, uh, the entire Marine Corps, is this a representation of this uh, spirit of these rangers being reinterpreted into the 20th century? Um, I, I think in a way, but if you look at what SOCOM says the seven core missions are of special operations forces, strategic reconnaissance, um, they, they trace their legacy back to the first way of war, but they're not engaging in the same kind of war as men like John Lovewell, John Gorham, and Robert Rogers were. So they kind of take, take that identity, but they put a 20th century spin on it. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head the seven core missions for special operations forces. But basically, they're there's doing the same thing as the Rangers did in the colonial period, short of killing women and children. And maybe they're doing that. And I know that's probably not that, all that popular of a statement to stay around here, but, um, you know. Sir. One of the great Indian fighters of the French and Indian War came from right here in Carlisle, Colonel, later Major General John Armstrong, Sr. Mm -hmm. uh, his expedition against Catanning would be not so much ranging as a punitive expedition deep into enemy country. Right. Uh, how do you assess the effectiveness of such punitive expeditions in the context of this first way of war? Um, the problem with the Catanning raid, right, is the, the Delaware were about ready to make peace. Um, and then Armstrong goes up there and raises one of their villages. And then they say, well, we're not going to come to peace for another two years. And there's God only knows how much suffering along this frontier. Um, back to the question about is it the militia's kind of war? Um, not everybody can be a ranger. So there's just a straight militia. Then there's also formation of, like Armstrong's expedition, just general militia, kind of like a rabble almost going out there and conducting this operation. Um, so yeah, that has a place in it with the, with the basic militia thing. Again, it's that spectrum. You've got the, the regulars, you've got the provincials, you've got the rangers, you've got the militia that's going to go out on a raid like the Catani raid. And then you're going to have just the straight militia that never leaves the, never leaves the blockhouse. Sure. Thank you. Well, uh, Dr. Grenier, as you can tell by the uh, rich variety of questions and the large crowd we have here tonight, you have uh, certainly uh, given us a very enlightening and educational look at uh, one of the important roots of, of our American military. For that, we're extremely grateful because uh, what we like to do is we, have, like, we like to have experts such as yourselves come here to tell us about uh, those aspects of our own history that we either uh, fail to understand entirely or grossly misunderstand. And it's, uh, it's, uh, you've done a, an excellent job of, of helping us to understand that. And what we'd like to do is, uh, in order to thank you, is we'd like to present a reduced copy of the poster thank that you. we use to advertise your lecture. Uh, in uh, appreciation for what you've done. So on behalf of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mark Viney and the entire staff of the Army Heritage Education Center, we'd like to uh, thank you very much thank and you very uh, much. wish you well. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you.